Hello, good evening, uh, good morning, and welcome to the mental health session uh, of today's IPDLN conference. Uh, my name is Rowan Borschman. I'm a psychologist and a senior research fellow in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne, and I'm very happy to be chairing uh, this session. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we are all meeting today. Uh, here in Melbourne, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. If you have any questions during um, this session, feel free to enter them into the, the Q&A box on the side there and we'll have time at the end um, for the speakers to respond to these questions. Today, we're gonna to hear from four great speakers talking about different aspects of mental health. Um, first up, we have Iforma Onyika, who's a research fellow at Queen's University in Belfast. Her research focuses um, on a range of projects, all of which make use of linked administrative data to better understand population mental ill health. Iforma's work explores the predictors and outcomes of mental ill health, including psychotropic medication use, multimorbidity, all-cause death, suicide, and other outcomes. Data sources include the 2011 census records of over a million residents of Northern Ireland linked to the enhanced prescribing database death registrations and other administrative data sources. Uh, over to you, Informa. Um, thank you, Ron. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Informa. I'm a research fellow at Center for Public Health, Queen's University, Belfast. And today I'm going to tell you about a paper on uh, mental health indicators and suicide risk. But before I do so, uh, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Professor Dermot O'Reilly and Dr. Edie Maguire. So suicide is an important public health problem that affects people in different parts of the world. It has been ranked as a fifth leading cause of death in high income countries, and it is on the rise Mental health, uh, poor mental health is a known predictor of suicide, but it is difficult to measure at population level. One way to do so is by using uh, routinely collected mental health indicators, such as self-reported mental health and record of prescription medication, particularly psychotropic or mental health medications. Self-reported mental health offers us information about a subjective mental health status, while psychotropic medication record provides objective measure of mental health status. Studies have, come, have examined these indicators individually, but it is unclear which of them is most associated with suicide and none of the studies have actually compared them together. So we set out to do this, to examine the relationship between self-reported mental health, psychotropic medication record, both of them in combination in relation to death by suicide. And to do this, we obtained data from three different sources, census record, enhanced prescribing database, and death registrations. Here in Northern Ireland, our last census was conducted in 2011. And the census data set is quite rich. It contains individual level information, social demographic details, household information, area level attributes, physical health conditions, and self-reported mental health. Enhanced Prescribing Database is a centralized electronic database of all medications dispensed at community pharmacies throughout Northern Ireland. So it has a nationwide coverage. So information from census record was linked to Enhanced Prescribing Database and to death registrations in order to track all deaths that occurred from 2011 to 2015. In this study, we identified suicide using ICD-10 codes denoting suicide and deaths of undetermined intent. 
Overall, we have data for over 1 million community dwelling adults aged 18 to 17 years alive and resident in Northern Ireland at the time of census. And during the follow-up period, we observed 857 deaths by suicide. And we used logistic regression models to examine the relationship between the mental health indicators and suicide deaths, adjusting for individual uh, level factors that are known to be uh, associated with suicide or poor mental health. Now let's look at the results. So this table, table one, shows the mental health status of the study population. And as you can see, majority of the cohort members, that's 84%, did not have any indicator of poor mental health. We found that 2.9% of them reported poor mental health in the census, but did not have any record of having received psychotropic medication. 8.6% of them received uh, psychotropic medication, but did not report their mental health status. And 5% of them had both self-report and medication record. This table shows the number of people that took their own lives and the results from the logistic regression analysis. And as you can see in the second column, out of the 857 suicide deaths, about half, which is 429, occurred in the subgroup without any indicator of poor mental health. We also found that a quarter of the suicide deaths, that is 207, occurred in those with both self-report and medication record. 155 deaths occurred in those with only psychotropic medication record, while 66 occurred in those with only self-report. In the unadjusted logistic regression model, we found that those with both self-report and medication record had the highest likelihood of taking their own lives with an odds ratio of 8.2. And this elevated suicide risk persisted in the full model adjusted for potential compounders with an odds ratio of six. And then uh, for the individual measures, the psychotropic, uh, those with psychotropic medication record have uh, odds ratio of 4.0 and then also show up 2.8 for those with only self-report. So based on our findings, our conclusion is that most of the deaths, about half of the deaths uh, uh, to be specific, occurred in those without any indicator of mental health. While those with both self-report and a uh, record of psychotropic medication had the highest likelihood of dying by suicide. Of the, in, of the measures individually, we found that those with psychotropic medication record had a higher likelihood of dying by suicide compared to those that had only self-report. Of particular interest is a subgroup that reported their mental health status but did not have any record of receiving psychotropic medication. Suicide risk was also elevated even in this subgroup. And it raises concern about the possibility of augment treatment need. It is also possible that people in this subgroup had less severe mental health conditions. And it's also possible that they might have received no medication treatment which we did not capture in this study. So understanding group at risk of dying by suicide and providing support will be very important for reducing suicide deaths. Finally, may I acknowledge Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency, NISRA, and other organizations and individuals that provided data and support for this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ifoma. That was a, a fantastic presentation, some really interesting findings there. I think it shows the importance of accessing multiple linked databases to, to maximise your findings. Um, we're going to go to the questions at the end, so we'll move right on to the next uh, presenter.
Um, the next presenter is Associate Professor Margot Barr from the Centre for Primary Healthcare and Equity at the University of New South Wales. Uh, Margot is leading research on access to primary and community healthcare and its impact on health service use using the primary and community health cohort linkage resource. Margot was previously the study director of the 45 and Up study at the Sachs Institute and principal epidemiologist and manager at the Centre for Epidemiology and Evidence at the New South Wales Ministry of Health. Also, uh, Margot is an honorary principal fellow at the University of Wollongong. Um, really looking forward to your talk, Margot. I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the other authors, Heidi, Julie and Luann. And I'd also like to acknowledge the tr traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting this paper, and that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Sorry, I just need to go to the next slide. Um, it's well established that mental illness is associated with poor physical and increased levels of chronic diseases. Uh, the mechanism and association of this is likely to work in both directions. Those with chronic diseases at an increased risk of developing mental illness and those with mental illness at are also a higher risk of developing chronic diseases. There's also evidence to suggest that having a mental illness may be related to poorer management of chronic disease, for example, through reduced adherence to treatment and the presence of risk behaviours. So the local health district with who we work with wanted to gain a better understanding of the needs of those with mental illness and how they access health services for ongoing management of their mental and physical health needs. But firstly, we needed to identify the mental illness cohort with our existing data linkage uh, analysis resource. So our resource, the uh, Central and East Sydney Primary and Community Health Cohort, um, is a longitudinal data linkage resource based on the 45 and up study. It's linked to primary care pharmaceutical data, um, and that's done deterministically and it's linked um, probabilistically to hospital ED and death data. So it includes around 30,000 people in Central and Eastern Sydney and around 250,000 in New South Wales. And the people were recruited to the study around 2008 and we've got follow-up data um, up to sort of to 2017 and 2018, depending on the data set. So to identify this mental health, our mental illness cohort, we looked at the MBS data, the PBS data, and the hospitalizations um, over a five year um, post recruitment period. And then we also looked at the five year mortality after that. So, all people residing in central and eastern Sydney area at baseline were included in the analysis. So, we were looking, um, we we're interested to look at the differences we would get depending on how we identified. Uh, the cohort and the various characteristics and, and the five-year mortality. So the use of administrative health data to identify mental illness cohorts has recently been investigated by the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, through their, some of their mental illness service uh, data integration projects. Um, in that project, they joined together MBS, PBS and death data. And so we use the same measures so that we could compare our findings. Specifically, the MBS related mental illness claims included in the MBS subsidised medical illness services such as psychiatrists, GP mental illness services and psychologists. The PBS was related mental illness claims and so the NO5 um, category of drugs and the NO6 category of drugs. Um, and then the hospitalizations that weren't included in the other study, but we included all hospitalizations related to the ICD-10 chapter for mental and dis behavioral disorders. So from this, we, we identified four mutually exclusive mental illness groups. So the first one, I'm not sure if you can see my hand, 
um, were those that had a PBS data, had MBS data, but not PBS data. So that was group one. Group two had PBS, was we identified people from the PBS data, but not from the MBS data. Group three, we identified people from both of the data sets that were linked together. And then our fourth group were people that we identified from the hospitalisation data that didn't have either an MBS or PBS record. So from this, we identified about 10,000 people within Central and Eastern Sydney, um, of which around half of them um, were, had PBS rec were had PBS records but not MBS records. Um, a, a quarter of them had um, MBS records but not PBS and another quarter of them had, um, had both. And we found 503 people who were no, in neither the PBS or the MBS data set, but were in the, um, that we identified in the hospital data. So this uh, graph shows a comparison for, for, we did a whole range of different characteristics, but this is really just looking at some of those characteristics and comparing the different groups. So the grey bar is where um, they had no claims for any mental um, health related um, mental health related claims or, or hospitalizations. Um, and the, the first bar after that is MBS only, PBS only, a combination of the MBS and PBS, and then just the ones that we identified from the hospitalizations. So as you can see, males were are less likely to claim for both MBS and PBS services. There were subtle differences between uh, different age groups, and I've just put one of the age groups there, um, with MBS really more based towards the younger age groups and, and PBS more for the older grade age groups. Um, smoking was about the same. Uh, the various chronic conditions varied across the different data sets that, that we had um, identified the cohort from. So then um, we compared the different death rates for each of these cohorts that we had identified. So if we looked at the people with no mental health flag, we were getting uh, around 80 per hundred, uh, per thousand um, in deaths. If we were looking at the hospitalization, but with no MBS or PBS data, it was around 630 per thousand um, uh, participants. And we, had, we didn't do any adjustment. We really just had calculated age-specific rates. Um, and as you can see in the other side of the graph with the various age-specific rates, the, the hospitalization group that had no MBS or PBS record, which really indicates that they really hadn't been interacting with um, any primary care type services, potentially, um, are very different across all of the different age groups. Um, whereas the other groups are quite similar. So if we if we use the cohort where we're just picking MBS or just picking PBS, it probably isn't very different, but the hospital only group is, is, is very different. So just in summary, um, if we only had um, access to hospital data, we would have only identified 6% of our cohort having a mental illness. Um, with the only, if we only had access to the MBS data, um, or the, um, the, the primary care data set, we would have identified 17%, 26% with the PBS data. And when we identify it with all sources, then we get about 36% of the, of the cohort uh, would be included. And as I said before, just looking at the different um, crude mortality rates, it does vary quite a lot across the different groups. So when, oh, the only other thing is when we compared it to some of the work that done by ABS, um, and it wasn't directly comparable because they had, um, had done calculations for Central and Eastern Sydney for all ages, and they were getting 20 per thousand. Um, and when we look at just the older age groups for Australia, um, they were around the 500 per thousand population. And that was a, you know, really just using the MBS and PBS data sets. So it's interesting to have a comparison, but we um, are not, it's, they're not directly comparable. 
Um, so the study demonstrates the strength of using linkage data sets to identify our disease cohort. In terms of which group to select for further research, um, it, it, like, it really depends on the focus of the research questions. But I think for most, question, most research questions, you would be using possibly a combination of MBS and PBS with the people, additional people we identify in the hospitalisation uh, data set, or at least the MBS and PBS together. Of course, this group we, of, of the people who were hospitalised but hadn't had a, didn't have an MBS and PBS record uh, are, are quite an interesting different group. And so, um, again, including them with the other groups may, and, you know, in that they, they may be quite different. Um, and so it might be worth us doing some more looking at those groups um, separately. Um, so the aim of this work was to develop a, a cohort that could be used to examine differences in the, in the management and um, of chronic diseases, such as care plans and cycles of care between those who do and do not have a mental illness. So um, that's the next part of the work that we'll be doing. So just in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of the funding bodies for this project, which is the Sydney and South East Sydney Local Health Districts, the Central and Eastern Sydney uh, Primary Health Network, and also the Sachs Institute, who are the custodians of the 45 and up study from which our resources derive, and the many thousands of people who have and are participating in the 45 and up study. Thank you. Thanks, Margot. That was a really great presentation and uh, it's quite an amazing data uh, resource that you've got access to there. Um, we'll move right on to our next speaker, who's Jimena Camacho, who's the Director of Population Health Data Analytics within the newly established Centre for Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne. Jimena was formerly the Director of Data and Analytics Services at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative, Evaluative Sciences in Ontario where she helps support researchers and health system planners. She's a researcher with extensive experience using linked health administrative databases to generate policy relevant evidence. And she's worked across a variety of fields, including cancer, cardiovascular, aging, and pharmacoepidemiology. She collaborates regularly with clinical government and academic partners and has both local and international networks. Jimena, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Rowan, um, and good evening, everyone. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing to support the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is the Australian drug regulator, uh, with some real world evidence generation in response to potential drug safety signals. I um, mean, I'd just like to note that this work was done in collaboration with folks at the University of Melbourne and UNSW in Australia along with others at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences in Toronto as part of a surveillance network that we've set up to support the TGA. And if anyone is interested in learning more about the framework that we have in place to support that work, I'd encourage you to view the on-demand presentation on supporting regulators through reference cycle analyses. So a couple of recent studies have suggested that there might be an association between psychostimulants and adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes. Psychostimulants are drugs that are used um, for the treatment of ADHD, and they include things like methylphenidate, amphetamines, dextroamphetamine, and lisdexamphetamine. So one of these studies used Medicare data from the United States and found a small increased risk of preeclampsia and preterm birth among women exposed to amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. The second study also used data from Medicaid, as well as data from five Nordic health registries, and they found a small increased risk of cardiac malformations associated with methylphenidate, but interestingly not with amphetamines, which was the association that was found in that first study. So we're starting to see some conflicting evidence here, which prompted the TGA to want some additional information to inform any decisions that they might want to make in relation to the use of these drugs in pregnancy. So for logistical reasons, basically centering around the ability to access data relatively quickly, we undertook a quick feasibility analysis using data from Ontario to examine the number of singleton pregnancies with exposure to psychostimulants during gestation and to look at crude rates of pregnancy um, complications and adverse neonatal outcomes. So the situation in Ontario is really interesting because we essentially had two sources of prescription dispensing data when it came to psychostimulants. 
The government funded prescription medication program covers everyone over the age of 65, as well as younger individuals who are on social assistance and that data goes all the way back to 1991. But in 2012, the Ontario government introduced new legislation to track all dispensing of controlled substances, regardless of who pays for those prescriptions. And psychostimulants fall under the category of controlled substances. So that gave us population level coverage, but for a shorter time frame. And so what we ended up doing was defining two different cohorts, one that was comprised of social security beneficiaries with a longer accrual period, and then another population level, population level cohort that went from 2012 onwards. And then we used a specialized collection of linked birth records between mothers and babies to identify singleton deliveries. And we linked that data to the broader hospitalization data to get maternal and neonatal outcomes. And then we went back to the medication data to ascertain exposure to psychostimulants which we defined as at least one dispense prescription where the day supply overlapped the pregnancy. And psychostimulants were defined as any prescription for any uh, of methylphenidate, amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, or the dexamphetamine prescriptions. And the unexposed group was anyone who didn't have a prescription for any of those uh, medications or for any other drug that's prescribed for ADHD, like atomoxetine, for example. So we had just over 80,000 pregnancies in the social assistance cohort and 450,000 in the general population group. In both cohorts, the proportion of exposed pregnancies was 1% or lower. But even though the exposure was really low, we were still able to see some signals that aligned with what we were seeing in the literature with significantly increased risk of placental abruption in both cohorts and preeclampsia in the population level group that were associated with psychostimulant use. We also saw increased risks of preterm birth, low birth weight, and admission to neonatal ICU across both cohorts, with an additional increased risk of congenital anomalies among the social security beneficiaries, and an increased risk of newborn seizures in the general population. Although, and I'm not showing the numbers here, um, the number of events were pretty small, so uh, we didn't want to read too much into that last one. Now keep in mind that these are only crude rates, but they do align with what others were finding. So this kind of spurred us on to think through how we could undertake a more comprehensive analysis where we could adjust for confounding and tease out whether there really was a safety issue there. And of course, the TGA being the Australian regulator is obviously gonna be more interested in data that reflects the Australian context. Although when it comes to safety and the issues around the effect of a molecule, then jurisdiction is less important. And obviously this information is still really useful even though it's from Ontario. Uh, but luckily by this time, we were able to access data from an ongoing study in New South Wales. So then we turned our minds to that next. So we had access to records on all of the women in New South Wales who gave birth between 2003 to 2012 and linked to hospital admission, medication and death data alongside records for their children, which included perinatal data and register of congenital conditions. Now, before 2012 in Australia, prescription medication data was actually only collected for drugs that were above a, a certain cost threshold. But for beneficiaries who were on social assistance, the threshold was low enough that virtually all medications listed on the formulary were captured. And so because we only had data prior to 2012, uh, we had to deal with this, just, this um, data issue. So we restricted our study population to social security beneficiaries in order to be able to ascertain exposure. And then we mirrored our definitions of exposure and outcomes as much as we could on the Ontario protocol. And we ended up with a cohort of almost 140,000 pregnancies that were conceived between 2003 and April of 2011 in New South Wales. 146 of those pregnancies were exposed to psychostimulants, so roughly 0.1%, which is about a tenth of what it was in Ontario. And one of the other interesting things that we noted was that more than half of exposed mothers had prescriptions dispensed in more than one trimester, which suggests continued use of the medication throughout pregnancy. So we took a quick look at the event counts and crude rates to confirm the preliminary signals that we had seen in Ontario. And we did see some significant associations between psychostimulants and increased risks of preeclampsia, preterm birth, low birth weight, and admission to neonatal ICU, which aligned with what we'd seen in Ontario and in the literature. We had initially hoped to use a high dimensional propensity score approach to adjust for confounding, but because we had such small numbers of exposures, we ended up having to implement a matched cohort analysis. So we matched each exposed pregnancy with up to 10 controls on year of conception, quintile of socioeconomic disadvantage, parity, smoking status, and age plus or minus a year. And then we looked at a number of different demographic and obstetric characteristics, comorbidities, and concomitant medication use. 
One of the really interesting things that we found was that almost 60% of the exposed women had documented smoking during pregnancy. So although smoking rates are generally higher among social security beneficiaries, this was higher than we expected. So we need to look into this a little bit more. We also found that exposed mothers were more likely to have had a mental health diagnosis in the prior year and accordingly to have a concomitant prescription for an anxiolytic, antipsychotic, antidepressant, or treatment for bipolar disorder compared to their match controls. And any characteristic that had a standardized difference bigger than 0.1, we considered to be unbalanced after matching and we adjusted for it in multivariate analyses. So we ran a conditional logistic regression to look at the association between exposure and outcomes among the match data, adjusting for any of those unbalanced covariates. And what was really interesting was that after matching, we saw that the previous association between psychostimulant, psychostimulant use and preeclampsia was no longer significant. But we did find a twofold increase in the odds of preterm birth and low birth weight among pregnancies that were exposed to psychostimulants compared to their match controls. And admission to neonatal ICU was significant in the unadjusted analysis, but no longer significant after adjustment. So what does this all mean? Well, we've seen some consistent signals across both the Ontario and New South Wales data with increased risk of preterm delivery, low birth weight, and babies requiring admission to the neonatal ICU. It's possible that the low birth weight is related to the premature birth. If, for example, we'd also seen a significant effect on small for gestational age, that might have suggested that psychostimulants had an impact on fetal growth. But since we're only seeing effects on low birth weight and premature delivery, it might be more related to something like reduced placental blood flow as a result of the medication, but uh, that's not clear at this point. As I alluded to earlier, the numbers of exposures and events that we were dealing with were really too small to undertake any really complex statistical adjustment to control for confounding, although we were able to adjust for some of it using the matched cohort design. Still, there's a really high risk of confounding by indication because we weren't able to restrict only to women with ADHD because it's a condition that's not really captured well in the administrative data. And because um, particularly in the adjusted analysis, we're only able to look at social security beneficiaries in somewhat old data and recognizing the prescribing of these medications, particularly in Australia, has really picked up in more recent years, then the results of the match analysis might not be generalizable to the broader population. So the next steps for this work are for us to undertake fully adjusted analysis in more contemporary Ontario data, where we'll address some of these issues and try to apply a high dimensional uh, propensity score or regular propensity score adjusted model. So that's it for me. I'd like to thank my collaborators again and thank you very much for your attention. You're on mute, Rowan. Thank you. That's chairing 101. Thank you, Jimena. Um, that was, I said, there was some really interesting findings um, and some concerningly high smoking rates. Um, it'll be interesting to see what you do find when you look more into that, uh, into those rates. So we're now up to our final speaker in this mental health session, uh, who's Professor Sarah Rogers from the University of Liverpool in the UK. Sarah is a professor, professor of health informatics with expertise in evaluating natural experiments and non-randomized intervention studies using anonymized linked administrative and health data sets. Sarah has established data linkage methodologies enabling retrospective individual level exposure allocation for environment and health research. Sarah's research focuses on using safe haven data that have been linked across health, social and environmental domains to explore the impact of exposures such as decent housing conditions, alcohol outlets, pollution and natural outdoor spaces on health and well-being. Over to you, Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Rowan. So, Good day, everyone. I am Sarah Rogers, as Rowan said, and today I'm going to talk about our project that examines the extent to which green and blue spaces improve our mental health and well-being. So we have a mainly UK-based team with the addition of Mark Newhausen in Barcelona. And I'd like to give special thanks to Fran, part of the Exeter team, and Dan in Swansea, who have recently done the data preparation and analyses that I'm gonna talk about today. 
So the aim of our project overall is to examine if changes through time in both ambient exposure surrounding the home and potential access to nearby green and blue spaces impact both the individual well-being and um, treatments for common mental health disorders. And so our pro full protocol is published in the link below. But today I'm going to focus mainly on the environment and survey data that have been linked for individuals. So we have just under a year to the end of our project now and we've completed objectives one to four. And we're at the exciting stage of just beginning to get some interesting results and I'm going to share one of those with you today. So the process of setting up the really large cohort that we have for 1.7 million adults is actually um, presented by my colleague Daniel Thompson is on a demand video in this conference so you can look at that if you'd like. But today I'm going to describe the process of generating the environment data set before illustrating the data linkage conducted in the SAIL data bank, which is held at Swansea University, and then describe some of the summary statistics from the survey data and some emerging results to answer the question, is well-being associated with time spent in nature? So when we think of green spaces, these can be parks, trees, gardens, backyards, and blue spaces include lakes, ponds, and the seaside, which is shown here, which is a, a nice spot a few miles to the west of Swansea. So it's important to note that we aren't evaluating a specific intervention, but the changes in spaces that occur as a result of complex systems changes driven by the economy, local and national policy, community groups, and developers, etc. So we processed some raw map data and extracted green and blue space features for more than a million homes in Wales, UK. Uh, we battled the cloud cover in Wales to extract greenness indices for 300 metres around each of the 1.4 million homes. And then we created measures of network access from each home to the nearest green and blue space. And we did this annually to create a longitudinal environment data set. And just to say that we co-developed this with our stakeholders, including local councils and national agencies, such as the Natural Resources Wales. So this diagram illustrates the data linkage carried out in the SAIL data bank. There are the usual trade-offs of large numbers versus depth of data. So in the routine data, we have 1.7 million adults, but with a binary yes, no uh, common mental health outcome measured from uh, primary care. For my talk today, we're concentrating on the survey data, which provides a very detailed picture of people's behavior, whether they visit the green and blue spaces and their well-being. for this is uh, only for 5,000 respondents. We're also using the household data um, that have been linked to the environment data. Uh, using a geographic information system, but we're not yet incorporating the routinely collected health data. So now to look at the data summaries. So one of the questions people answered was the WEMWEB scale. Uh, this was originally validated in the UK. And what they found was that couples were happier than divorced widow people. And this was a significant difference despite there only being three points separating them. So it's useful to bear that in mind when I present the results in a couple of minutes. Um, the 5,000 people who participated in the National Survey for Wales showed a similar distribution to the UK validation sample. So here's the, the routinely generated green and blue space features on the left. Fewer than 100 people lived right next door to a park, but many respondents seem to have the potential to access a green or blue space within 200 metres from their home. And as for the weekly outdoor leisure time on the right, uh, about a fifth reported spending zero hours in the outdoors um, note that it was capped at uh, 420 minutes though, this is equivalent to about an hour a day. So we used these data to test a hypothesis. We wanted to know whether people living closer to green and blue spaces reported a higher well-being score uh, and if this relationship was mediated by the amount of leisure time spent outdoors each week. So what we found was there was a definite positive relationship between outdoor leisure time and well-being uh, reported using the WEM web score. But do you, 
proximity to green and blue spaces from your home residence does not appear to be important for well-being in this population sample. How much time people spend outdoors is the important factor in deriving well-being benefits. And this replicates somewhat the earlier results from England um, by Matt White and colleagues, but they, it, because it ours was a linear relationship rather than a, um, a, a curved relationship, we didn't have the inflections at the 120 minutes and 300 minutes range. If we were just to think about this um, association for a moment, if we took those who spend very little time outdoors and they could find two extra hours to spend in outdoors each week, admittedly this is quite a large ask, they would perhaps have a well-being score increase of 0.78. So compared to three points with a, a major life event such as divorce, it seems fairly respectable. So some of the strengths and limitations of this uh, new, new result. For the 5,000 respondents, we had information on whether they visited a green and blue space, which is important because it actually spoke to their behaviour. Uh, and this survey gives us the information on well, uh, about well-being on a continuous scale. Um, uh, the routine data, of course, doesn't give us any information on behaviour and it stops at those seeking treatment for their, uh, from their GP for a mental health condition. So what we want and what we get here is the missing part of the picture, which is the well-being in the community at large. Um, however, the well-being and behaviour data were from a cross-sectional survey, so we don't have any way of working out if well-being influences visits or vice versa. Oh. I just want to mention also there that many studies have used environment data that have been aggregated over small areas and are a single snapshot in time. But using the residential data linkage in the cell data bank, we can link the environment data based on each home to the full cohort of 1.7 million people and their routinely collected health data. And this reduces ecological fallacy uh, by using accurate data based on each person's home and allows us to anonymously follow up uh, those people as they move home and update their larger changes in green and blue spaces uh, for these self-selected moves. So the next steps that we want to do, firstly with the survey data, are further analyses looking at those who are more deprived, uh, materially deprived, and explore if there's any mediation by physical activity that we also have in the um, survey data. When we link to the mental health uh, conditions um, that are in the routine data, when we expand to that larger cohort, uh, we think that possibly because we didn't see that modelled access to green and blue spaces was associated with well-being in the survey example, we may still find associations with this and common mental health disorders within our longitudinal section of this study. Um, despite the CMD being a, a less informative binary measure, and this is because we, uh, we know that we've set up the environment data as accurately as possible for each person's home and their likely exposure uh, and access. So our next step is then to triangulate the wellbeing survey results with the longitudinal data for the large million cohort for whom we have exposures clearly preceding treatments and diagnosis for mental health conditions. And so the idea is to try and understand if these routinely collected data may help us move towards causality to unpick the natural changes occurring as a result of new developments, general policy and economics in the UK over the last decade. So uh, watch this space. Uh, this is the acknowledgement to the funder, the National Institute of Health Research, and the link to the project page where the uh, links to the papers associated with this project will be. And if anyone wants a nice, a little easy reading recap of the um, study, then I wrote a blog earlier in the year, which depicts some of the points uh, that we've uh, included in, in our project. So that's it from me, thank you very much. Thanks Sarah, um, it was a really interesting study and um, 
some very relevant findings uh, for those of us here in Melbourne looking at the, the association between outdoor time and uh, well-being. We've, we've just come out of a few months of lockdown, so uh, that, that struck a chord with me personally. Um, also, your, your plans um, sound really interesting. I'll be keen to hear the, the updated um, version of that in, in months and years to come. So thank you very much to all four of our speakers for four really great presentations. We do have some questions in the live Q&A section that have come through. So um, I might just run through some of those now. I've got five or six questions. So um, let's see, the first question is for uh, Informa from Leone. Um, Leone asks, uh, does psychotropic medication increase suicide risk? And do you have information on other treatment modalities such as psychotherapy? Um, well, yes. Um, we have a, a separate paper, uh, not this particular one I have presented, but we have a, a separate paper that uh, shows a, a relationship between a psychotropic medication and suicide risk. And uh, there are actually some other studies out there already, but uh, in this other study that I'm talking about, not this one I presented here, we looked at uh, different types of uh, psychotropic medications. And uh, yes, there's an association between a psychotropic medication and the suicide risk. And uh, I think there's a second question. What's the second question again? Uh, second question was, do you have information on other treatment modalities such as psychotherapy? Uh, no, no, uh, um, because like I, I acknowledged in the uh, conclusion that it's possible that some people receive the non-medication based uh, treatment, which we didn't capture. So this is probably one of the uh, drawbacks when you use uh, administrative data, you don't have some of this uh, information, but for this one, no, we don't have um, information about uh, uh, this non-medication type of treatment. Thank you. And one more question for you, Ifoma. Um, the question was uh, from Lisa Sharwood. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Can I ask about the adjustment using religion? What was the source of this indicator and did you break down by specific religion? Um, and how significant was this variable univariately? Okay, so um, I think Northern Ireland is, uh, it, it's a, it's, quite unique in that uh, um, religion, it's, it's, I didn't have to put it, but uh, uh, it's based on their history. It's always a good idea to adjust uh, based on um, uh, the religion. Uh, uh, here in this analysis, we grouped uh, 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 the religion in terms of uh, whether they are uh, uh, Roman Catholics or whether they are Protestant or other religion and then those without any religion. And then we found out that um, those without any form of uh, uh, religion, uh, the, the risk of suicide was higher compared to, to the other one. So uh, let me just say that unlike in other places here in Northern Ireland, it's, um, it's adjusting uh, for religion in not just this type of research, every type of thing, it's something that is unique. Uh, but in other places could be a uh, kind of race or maybe some other kind of um, a division. But here in Northern Ireland, we, it's religion. So it is, um, we found that, I found a difference based on that. But uh, in the fully adjusted model, uh, uh, and fully just a model of that uh, association wasn't there. Some other factors were stronger than um, the religion, but in univariate analysis, yes, but in fully adjusted model, no, other factors were stronger than that. Thanks, Thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Sarah from David Preen. Uh, David says, nice presentation. Surprising that spending time outdoors in Wales is good for your mental well-being, with a smiley face. Uh, any comments on the external validity of your findings to other locations, which may have different population densities and climates? Mm. That's a good question. Thanks, David. Um, I think the... The, our collaborator, Mark Newhausen, has been involved with a larger study called Phenotype, which has um, 
data from all over Europe. So he's found similar things for all over Europe, but I, I can't really comment on, um, I, I can't bring the literature to mind for Australia, for instance, that might, um, or, or the Southern United States that might be quite different there. Um, perhaps it's a bit hot to, to get outside at some times of the year. Um, yeah, hopefully that we will find there's an external validity, but uh, only only done some work similar with England so far. So it's not too different, I guess, there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I've got another question for you here from Rosalind. Uh, Sarah, great to have environmental proximity to green blue spaces related to actual environmental behavior. It would be interesting to look at access and use of transport. So yeah, so we do have um, our model, our generalized additive model was actually adjusted for car use. So we do have a measure of private transport in there. But yeah, I agree, it would be useful to see it's our results stratified for uh, car use, um, specifically yes or no, there, that would be a, a good point to look at as well as material deprivation and, and other indicators that are associated with that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, got a couple of questions for Margot here now. Um, quick one from Colleen. Does 45 and up link to the New South Wales Mental Health Ambulatory Data Collection? Uh, yes, it does. And we did have that in the data set as well. Um, and we sort of did it as a little bit of a validation check afterwards, seeing if we picked up any more people um, in that data set than what we did with the PBS, the MBS and the hospitalizations. And most of them um, were covered from the data sets that we had, although we were finding more um, from the PBS data set, uh, from the MBS data set, which is the primary care data, which wasn't necessarily in the ambulatory care. But, um, and the 45 and up data set is really the questionnaire data. And then depending on the research you're doing, you then organize for the linkage to the the various data sets. So, of course, it depends on what you're linking together. And so in our, with our project, we have linked to the ambulatory data as well. Thanks, Margot. And uh, a question here, anonymous question. Uh, Margot, I'd like to know how you measured mental illness in people under 45 years of age. This would be a significant cohort, and I wonder why you didn't include. So the 45 and up study recruited people um, who were 45 years and over. So that's why it was limited to people 45 years and over. Um, and of course, what we were trying to do was, um, yeah, the, the challenge is when you do have a cohort of, and you want to, um, you know, we've got multiple sources of information about um, various kinds of mental illness as well as people's service um, utilization. So that's why we were trying to I suppose replicate what the ABS had been doing using, um, you know, using a sort of a standard set of um, criteria um, rather than um, inventing criteria of our own. So that's why we we had you know identified the use the various services that were um, various claims for mental illness um, or mental care type um, things and the various medications um, and then also. You know, there's, there's error in all of these, um, you know, having the medications that has the whole chapter for the hospitalizations may not have been appropriate and we can drill into that more. Um, but we were just really trying to say, well, once we find this uh, cohort of people with a mental illness, then the main thing we wanted to look at is how does their health uh, differ in particular with regard to physical health um, to those that weren't um, identified as, as having a mental illness. Thanks, Margot. Just one more question for you here. Um, for the hospital admission only category, uh, sorry, for the hospital admission only category is older and I see dementia was one of the code categories taken from AIHW. Uh, surely that would be skewing it to older ages. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and it's one of the things that we're thinking about whether um, our cohort, we should have an upper age limit to it um, because that was one of our concerns about, um, and certainly it may be better not including that hospital only group 
in our cohort um, that we are, you know, finally sort of settle on um, because of those differences. It's also a question, even if we're using the MBS, the cohort that we identify with the MBS and PBS data, of having perhaps an upper, co uh, upper cut off as well um, because of those medications for dementia that are included in, the, um, in those categories. Thanks, Margot. Um, Jimena, I've got a question for you here from Leone that's just come through. Um, the outcomes seem quite concerning regarding the neonatal outcomes. Uh, what has been the clinical response? Uh, so we've been working most closely with the regulator um, and they're sort of taking all of this information on board and they'll make a decision as to uh, whether they want to increase the warnings around these medications. Um, we haven't gotten to the extent where we've um, published anything yet because we're still running some, uh, like there's still a need to run more adjusted analyses. Most of the stuff that we've done has been sort of um, high level feasibility analysis, which is informative, but obviously there's still a lot of unmeasured confounding that we have to manage before we can kind of reach that point. And so, although we're feeding this information back to the regulator as soon as we have it, there's also a need to kind of do some more rigorous um, investigation. But yeah, I agree with you that it's something that, um, pregnant women who are taking these medications really need to know about so that they can make an informed decision as to whether or not they want to continue taking these medications throughout pregnancy. Thank you. I was actually really struck by the, the high smoking rates that you mentioned. Um, and you said you're going to look into it further. I'm not sure what, what the exact plans were or whether you've got any hypotheses about why that might be the case or sort of what, if you can comment further on that. So I'm, I'm not a, a clinician, I'm not an expert in, in sort of maternal health. Um, my, I would pass this to my collaborators to, um, to address more um, thoroughly. I will say that the data is a little bit older um, as it only went up to 2012 and it's possible that behaviors have changed in the last sort of eight years. So we may not see the same rates of smoking when we look at more recent data. Um, and like I said, the, the rates of smoking among a concessional cohort or a cohort of um, people on social assistance do tend to be higher than in the general population. Um, but this was sort of strikingly high. Also noting that, I mean, there were 146 individuals who were in that exposed category. So like we're dealing with small numbers, it's not gonna take much to make those percentages look really large. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so that's all the questions that's come through. Oh no, it's a couple more, sorry, just come through now. Um, uh, Jimena, Lisa's asked, wasn't the smoking rate due to the case ascertainment for the mums study? Um, so that would have explained a higher rate, but the mums study, I believe, um, and I'm really sorry I'm blanking, but um, I believe it was looking at a general, the, the data that was pulled was for a general concession or a general population, although the actual analysis for mums was gonna be done on smokers. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here for Sarah. Um, Sarah, did you, did you work at, I think that means, did you look at who made up the quarter who don't get outdoors? Uh, parents with small children or perhaps the elderly? If parents of small children are either stuck indoors or standing bored at a playground, it could be that they do get outdoors but are not reaping the health benefits. Yeah, so some of my um, co-investigators have small children and I think they've suggested the same. Um, I don't know whether the survey data includes family members, um, but we could definitely, we could try to look into that using the routine link data set, which has the household linkage mechanism. So we'll have an idea of if there are school children in the household. So I think we have plans to do that as one of our future analyses. So but thank you for raising that. Okay, so thank you to the audience. That's all the questions that have come through. We've still got a few minutes left. So uh, if you don't mind, I've got a couple of questions I'd just like to ask quickly. Um, firstly, for Iforma, um, your data were from 2011. I just wondered when the next census is due and whether you have any plans to work with those updated data. 
Uh, next census, I think it should be next year because we have every 10 years. 10 years. It be next years. Uh, it should be next year, 20, uh, 2021, I think. Uh, of course, the COVID situation has really disrupted a lot of things, but I, I think it should be next year. And uh, as we get uh, more information, of course, we, we would like to uh, explore this study further, especially some of the findings that are a bit concerning. So yeah, it's, it's something we would like to explore further as we receive new data. Yeah. Great. And a final question from me for Margot. Uh, Margot, if, if I've understood correctly, um, the increased death rate that you mentioned in the hospitalised but no MBS or PBS records group, does this reflect people falling through the cracks of the health system? Or I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, and um, certainly that's our first thought when we looked at the data, um, because, of course, the, um, the PBS and MBS data is mainly from um, primary care. Um, and so... Yeah, that was our first in, impression. Um, and so um, I suppose one of the things we wanted to look at is if there were others, other places that these people may be going. But it's certainly the indication with both the higher death rates across all of the different age groups and, um, you know, sort of um, even in the characteristics with, with higher rates in, a, in various chronic diseases, they certainly were very a very different cohort than what we were identifying in the other groups. The part that I think is always interesting when you're looking at linked data, of course, is often people will identify a, um, a cohort of people with mental illness from just hospital records. Um, and so um, I think that's the real strength when we have these primary care linkage data sets where we are able to look at, you know, services across the whole spectrum rather than just either looking just at one data set or if we're only looking at that tertiary data, those, those tertiary um, occasions of care. Thank you. Um, we've got two minutes left and there's one question that's just come through. One last question for Ifoma. I'm just wondering if you've been able to feed your results back into the next census and um, if they've been influential at all. I already got the last part of your question. <laughs> oh, have they been influential in, in the next census, I think is what the... Uh, audience members asking? How this particular uh, will be inflation? Well, I, I, I wouldn't know at this moment, but uh, what I do know is that um, when we receive new data, because uh, we have actually, we have a very large project and uh, um, suicide, um, mental health is a whole bunch of them. Uh, uh, they are topics that are very important to us here in Northern Ireland. Uh, so we're very keen on doing, uh, extending this project as we receive new data. So I, I think uh, I'm quite optimistic that uh, as we get new data, we will have a, a new data after the next census, we'll be able to explore this uh, further and some other related topics. And do you know, I, I think the, the question was that whether your uh, existing data have been fed into the, the upcoming census. Do you know if you've had any influence on that? Sort of what's what's proposed in the census? No, I, I don't have any idea because uh, I I don't work with the people uh, planning the census. No, I don't have any idea in relation to that. No. Yeah. Sure. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we're down to sort of less than two minutes left. I'm I'm just going to wrap up and um, thank you to all four speakers for for four really great um, presentations. Um, I believe that this session recording will be online in about 48 hours from now on the, the website, the conference website. Um, if you like these presentations, you should head on over to the on-demand sessions where you can watch um, a lot of other great presentations um, at your leisure. Um, and otherwise, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending this session. Um, and I hope you enjoy the, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thanks again to all of the presenters for this evening.